I'm Nadja Swart for biznews.com and joining me today is Dr. Jason Fung, a Toronto-based nephrologist, a New York Times best-selling author and a world-leading expert in intermittent fasting and low-carb diets. Dr. Fung, thank you so much for your time. Well, great to be here. Thank you. By way of introduction, what is your medical background? So I'm a kidney specialist, so I did medical school at the University of Toronto, then I did my um, internal medicine there, and I did the subspecialty then afterwards in kidney diseases at the UCLA, and then I came back to Toronto and I've been practicing as a nephrologist since, uh, since then. So that leads me to a question that most people ask, what is nephrology? <laughs> it's really the study of kidney diseases. So, um, you know, internal medicine, uh, there's, you, you can subspecialize after that into all of the different organ systems. So there's heart specialists and lung specialists, and I'm a kidney specialist. All right. And you authored two New York Times best-selling books, if not more, uh, two of which were The Obesity Code and The Diabetes Code. Can you briefly unpack the sort of salient message from each of these works? Yeah, so The Obesity Code is really a discussion of the science behind weight loss and weight gain. So a lot of uh, the misconceptions about uh, losing weight is that it's all about calories, but that's not really how the body works. It's uh, one part of things, but probably the less important of those factors. And the more important thing is really the, um, the hormones in the body, because the amount of uh, body fat you carry is actually very tightly regulated. So it's an important aspect. Think about uh, the wild. You very rarely see morbidly obese animals because it's a huge problem. Uh, you're either going to get eaten because you can't run away or you're not going to be able to catch food. So very few animals have, uh, you know, are very, very uh, obese in the wild because the amount of body fat that they carry is very tightly regulated. And humans are the same. We actually have systems in our body to uh, tell us to eat more, which is hunger, and to tell us to stop eating, which is satiety. So there uh, are uh, pathways, for example, like leptin, where if it's activated, your body will stop eating. And there are certain hormones that are going to activate it and disactivate it. So, for example, nicotine is a classic example of a drug that just stops you from eating. And when people smoke, they lose weight. When they stop smoking, they gain weight. And it's a fairly well-known phenomenon that has nothing to do with the calories. That is, that's not the primary controlling factor. Uh, if you don't eat, yes, you're going to lose less calories, but uh, that's not what controls it. That's sort of the, the, the mechanism by how it's delivered, but it's turning off that sort of hunger signaling that the hormones can do it. And it's the same on the other side. If you turn on the hormones that tell your body to gain weight, it will gain weight. And that's the hormone insulin. Insulin is a, um, is a hormone that tells your body to store body fat. So if you tell the body to store body fat, it will store body fat. So therefore, what's important is not just the calories. The calories is just sort of the, the means by which these hormones uh, sort of exert their effect. It's really the uh, hormones that are controlling how much body fat you carry and by understanding that, you can then try to adjust the foods that you eat, for example, and also how frequently you eat to adjust these hormones. Um, and that's what intermittent fasting does. So yes, it does uh, cause you to eat fewer hormones, but more importantly, it allows the hormonal changes to allow you to lose body fat. And the diabetes code? The diabetes code was an extension of that. So type 2 diabetes is a disease that, again, is uh, relatively misunderstood in that people used to think that it was sort of this chronic and progressive disease. In fact, it's changed, uh, but only as of last year. So that was sort of five years after I published the other book. And mm -hmm. um, the, the idea is that type 2 diabetes is actually a reversible disease and largely a dietary disease. And therefore, using drugs is not an effective way to reverse a dietary disease. You actually have to fix the diet. So mm -hmm. the uh, thing about type 2 diabetes 
is it's also a disease of excessive insulin so that if you use these uh, treatments to uh, lower insulin levels and intermittent fasting, you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. So both obesity and type 2 diabetes are diseases of sort of too much insulin. Therefore, dietary treatments to lower the insulin level are going to be effective in reversing it. And we've used it for you know, hundreds of patients to reverse their type 2 diabetes. What are the primary benefits of intermittent fasting? And also, when we speak about intermittent fasting, is it uh, an allocation of eight hours per day that you can eat, or 16, or are there various versions of intermittent fasting? There's, there's uh, sort of an infinite variety of fasting. Fasting is really just refers to any time that you're not eating. So the sort of one of the things that has happened over the last 30, 40 years is that people are sort of eating all the time. So if you look at people's food habits, they're actually eating every few hours from the minute they get up almost to the moment they go to bed. And what that does, of course, is that it tells your body to, when you eat, insulin goes up, it tells your body to store calories. And you store it in the form of sugar, which is which can cause then type 2 diabetes, or body fat, which can then cause um, obesity. What fasting does is allow you to uh, allow your insulin levels to fall, and that's a trigger to go from the sort of feeding state where you're trying to store calories to the fasted state where you're burning calories. So it's a very simple concept. That is, when you eat, your body wants to store those calories. When you don't eat or when you're fasting, your body needs to use those calories, otherwise, uh, you know, you would die in your sleep every single night. It, your, your body stores it in two forms, either sugar or body fat. So if you want to lose body fat or get your sugars down, then all you need to do is increase the period of fasting that allows your body the time to use up those stores of calories. You can't do it while you're feeding because insulin is high. Your body is trying to store calories, not use them. So if you think about it, it's, it's a really simple concept. Now, so how long should you fast for? Well, on a regular day, you might eat, say, breakfast at 8 a.m. and dinner at like 6 p.m. That's a 10-hour feeding window and a 14-hour fasting window. That's sort of what you should be doing mm. almost every single day. Um, if you sort of tweak that a little bit and you want to try and lose weight or get your sugars down, then you can go to 16 hours, for example, or you could push it longer if you wanted to. There's nothing to stop you. You could go 24 hours, you could go 36 hours. Uh, you know, the point is that if your body has excess sugar or excess body fat, then you have a store of calories. All you're doing is allowing your body to use it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's literally why we have body fat in the first place. It's not there for looks. It's there for you as a source of calories when you need it. So let your body use it up. You can't let your body use up the body fat if you're eating because you're simply telling your body the exact opposite thing. You're telling your body to put food in, not take food calories out. But are periods of, say, 18 to 36 hours of intermittent fasting, are they sustainable in a weight loss sense? Because what I would assume would happen the moment that you eat something again is that your body is starved. It is perceived to, you know, be in threat of no, n not a continuance of food. And so it stores everything that you eat. Yeah, that's uh, one of the sort of misconceptions of fasting. One is that people will be sort of excessively hungry. Um, that doesn't always happen. In fact, a lot of people, they find their hunger is stable or actually goes down. And second thing is that people think that you go into this so-called starvation mode, which is that you store everything as fat and you, you burn very little. In fact, that's what happens when you go on calorie-reduced diets. Um, if you think about calories, so... Let's suppose, for example, that you're eating 2,000 calories a day, you're burning 2,000 calories. You also have to think, and, and people think about, oh, calories in, calories out. But they're forgetting, of course, that there's a third variable here, which is the stores of calories. So you've got the calories coming in, 2,000, calories going out, 2,000. But you also have this huge reservoir 
of calories, which is body fat. So if you have, suppose, uh, you know, each pound of fat carries about 3,500 calories. If you're 100 pounds overweight, so if you're 50% body fat and you weigh 200 pounds, that's 100 pounds of body fat. So that's not unusual when you, you know, people are trying to lose weight. So they may have 100 pounds of body fat. Well, that's like 350,000 calories of energy that are stored on the person's body, right? So you have 2,000 coming in, 2,000 going out, and 350,000 just sitting there in storage. Well, if you don't eat 2,000 calories, well, what's going to happen? So you're fasted, you're fasting that day, 2,000 calories. What happens? Well, your body takes out 2,000 from that 350,000. Now you have 348,000. So the question is, what's wrong with that? That's an entirely natural process. That's why your body is carrying all that body fat. It's a store of energy. So when you don't use it, well, why would your body reduce the amount of calories it's burning, which is the 2,000? Why would it go down on that 2,000? And the answer is it doesn't. When you fast, you actually do much better. What happens when you try to eat a low fat diet, you know, and eat 10 times a day is that you're keeping your insulin levels very high. And therefore that 350,000 calories of energy is actually cut off. You can't access that anymore. So now you eat 1500 calories going in, you have 2000 going out, but you actually have no calories that you can access in that, in that storage, right? Just like if, you have all your money in the bank and your bank is closed. Well, you can't get at that money. In this case, you have all those calories stored away, but you can't get at them because you're eating all the time. You're telling your body, store calories, not burn calories. So now you take 1,500 calories in, your body wants to burn 2,000, but it can't because it has no access to the body fat. So it must reduce its energy expenditure by 500. So now you're metabolic rate has gone down to 1500 in order to balance and that's why eating those calorie reduced diets that we recommended for the last 40 years where you eat sort of 10 times a day and you're eating very low fat foods which tend to be high in carbohydrates which is very high in insulin you're keeping insulin high you have no access to your body fat stores and your metabolic rate is dropping so if you eat 1500 and your body burns 1500 you're not going to lose weight the key is not how many calories in you're taking, how many calories out. It's whether you can get that calories out from your body fat, right? That's the key. So think about it this way. If you go to the grocery store, you buy food, you put away in the fridge. Now your fridge is completely full. Well, what if you don't go to the grocery store that day? Well, you just eat the food in your fridge. No big deal, right? Mm. It's the same on your body. If you don't eat, and you allow your insulin levels to fall. And that's the key because that's what's locking away the, 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 the insulin. Mm. Then you're going to take the food out of your body fat, your 2,000 calories out of your body fat. No big deal. But if you lock your fridge and you don't go to the grocery store, all of a sudden you have nothing to eat. And that's a problem. So that's, that's the idea is that it's not just about calories. It's really about letting your body access the stores of calories when it needs to. When we give people cal uh, insulin, like as a, as a medicine, we see exactly the same thing. You, you, you're, you're literally telling your body to store body fat. That's the signal. That's, that's what, how, how your body knows how to store body fat is when insulin goes up. And if you tell it to store body fat, it will. So people who take insulin, they gain weight. When you take away that insulin, they lose the weight. And is it another misconception that when you practice intermittent fasting, that in those hours allocated for eating, you can eat anything you want? Uh, yeah, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> There's uh, two important <laughs> things, right? There's the foods that you eat. And then there's how often you're eating and both are important. So if you, um, you know, so that's sort of two different levers. If you change the foods, you're always eating really good foods, low, you know, natural foods, you know, um, then you can lose weight. 
Um, if you do fasting, you can lose weight. But if you sort of eat really bad food and fast, you're not going to be as successful as you want to be. So you really have to affect both things, which is the types of food, the quality of the food, um, what you're eating, and also how often you're eating it. Because if you eat sort of, you know, all of the bad stuff, you know, you're eating junk food and fast food and chips and ice cream in that one meal, you're not going to lose weight. That just is not going to happen. I'd love for it to happen like that, but it doesn't. And that's the, uh, you know, the misconception because it's like sometimes people do studies and then they say, well, you can fast. And then when you're eating, just eat whatever. It's like, well, so then you're doing one good thing, which is fasting and one bad thing, which mm -hmm. is, you know, eating junk food. And in the end, that cancels out. Mm. In what ways do you think that the modern treatment of diabetes is flawed? Um, it's flawed because for two reasons. One is that um, it was considered chronic and progressive, and it never really was. It's just a big lie. So I'll tell you that if you look in the, say, American Diabetes Association, up until a few years ago, they had on their website that type 2 diabetes is chronic and progressive, which means that once you got it, it's going to get worse and there's nothing you can do about it. Now, all the while they're saying this, and this is up to about two years ago, three years ago, um, everybody knew it was a lie because if people lost weight, your diabetes would either get better or go away. So everybody knew it was all about the weight. And yet here, all these doctors were saying that it's not about the weight, it's just the way it is. You get it, it's going to progress. Mm -hmm. It's actually completely reversible. And now the American Diabetes Association, as well as uh, other, other countries, have said that this is actually a reversible disease, and they've set criteria as to what remission of type 2 diabetes is. So that was one of the big mistakes, is saying that it was um, irreversible. The second big mistake is pretending that you can use drugs to treat a dietary disease. That is, if the root cause of your disease is a dietary problem, you can't just give a bunch of drugs and hope that it will go away. You gotta, you gotta fix the um, root cause, which is what was causing it. Well, it was your bad diet. Well, we know that because if you look at type 2 diabetes, it was very unusual in the 70s around the world. And it's been gaining, uh, you know, as we've had this obesity epidemic, it's just gone right along uh, the way up. So therefore, it wasn't about genetics. It wasn't about, you know, this is the way it is. It was clearly to do with our diet and lifestyle. So the focus should always have been on the diet and lifestyle. Instead, we basically tried to drug it out of existence and then wondered why our drugs didn't work. And when our drugs didn't work, we said, well, it's because it's a chronic and progressive disease. So we're, you know, at the same time, we knew that was a complete lie. So we are basically lying to ourselves. We are so unsuccessful in the treatment of weight loss with, with these sort of calorie reduced diets um, that we are so that we are unsuccessful in trying to use diet to treat uh, type two diabetes, and uh, therefore we basically lied to ourselves, saying that well, it's not our fault. It's because that's the way the disease is. So the, 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 the whole thing is that we are caught in this low-fat paradigm for type 2 diabetes for so long. And if you remember back in the 80s and 90s, you know, all fat was just bad for you, right? And that, that's why people started to say in the 2000s when they started looking at Mediterranean diets and nuts and olive oil and fatty fish and uh, that kind of thing, they, started, they had to say healthy fat. Because it was understood for the previous two decades that all fat was bad for you. But it turns out that it's not. So now a lot of people, uh, you know, acknowledge that, you know, fat is, you know, a lot of these natural fats are perfectly fine. So we are stuck in this uh, old paradigm of low fat, all fat is bad for you, therefore eat lots of carbs. And that was the sort of prevailing uh, wisdom at the time. So it was be fine if we we're eating like broccoli and beans, but it wasn't, we weren't eating that, we were eating sort of bread and potatoes kind of thing. And the problem with that, of course, is that the bread and the potatoes tend to raise your blood glucose. So, you know, it was a strange sort of thing where we are telling people whose blood glucose was too high, we are telling them to eat low fat foods like bread, because it was low fat, 
at the same time, we knew the bread would raise their blood glucose much more than any other food almost in existence. So you had type 2 diabetics eating, you know, white bread and jam in the morning and rice in the afternoon and past in the evenings. But we know from our studies of the glycemic index that those foods are going to just spike your sugars like no, like no tomorrow. Uh, and people were eating them, eating five, six times a day. Well, every time you eat, your insulin goes up, your sugars go up. So why would you eat six, eight times a day? Because now you're pushing your blood glucose up six, eight times a day. And you're eating the foods that are going to push it up the most. And then we wondered why our treatment was, was not working. Well, it's because our dietary treatments. It's because the diet was just almost, almost completely the wrong ones for our diets. Now you have studies on low carb diets and they find that you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes with just cutting down the carbohydrates. Are you a proponent of the low carbohydrate, high fat diet? Um, I think low carbohydrate is the main thing and it's not really even all carbohydrates. It's, it's mainly the refined carbohydrates. Eating a high fat diet, I mean, you can eat high fat or you can eat high protein. Either one is, is going to work okay. Uh, the ketogenic diet mm -hmm. was a high fat diet and it is successful for a number of people, but I don't think it's necessary to. And, um, you know, again, the main thing which the ketogenic diet, um, you know, people forget that one of the key sort of core things was that you, you had to eat natural foods. It wasn't e about eating fat for fat's sake. It was about eating high fat natural foods, things like butter and avocado and fatty fish and animal meats that were high in fat. So the fatty cuts of the meat. So eating those uh, sort of foods that are natural, but high in fat is okay. Not eating processed foods that are high in fat. That's not the idea of the whole thing. Second last question, what are the top three food mistakes that you think people make in general? So in general, I think the number one mistake is eating too often. And I think that that is sort of, you know, if you look at the changes in diet from uh, the 1970s to today, and the 1970s is a time where there's not a lot of food shortages and there's not a lot of obesity. Um, but if you look at how often they ate, it was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And now people are eating six, eight, ten times a day sometimes. So you, that means you have, you know, breakfast, then you have a mid-morning snack, then you have, you know, uh, lunch, and then nobody thinks twice about a mid-afternoon snack, an after-school snack, and then dinner, and then nobody again thinks twice if you're eating in the, you know, in front of the TV or at the movies. Uh, or a bedtime snack. So it's become so ingrained that you can eat all the time that uh, people are just naturally eating six, eight, ten times a day. But again, if you're telling your body to store fat, to store calories as body fat three times a day versus ten times a day, well, you're going to do better with three times a day. But that was one of the big changes that nobody had really thought about, uh, but did happen sort of inadvertently over these past few years. So now the idea is simply to cut it down so that you, you know, just eat less frequently. And I think that's the major mistake that most people have made. The second big mistake that people, um, I think, uh, make is the processing of foods. So this was, you know, Again, I think the most important thing is the eating natural foods as opposed to sort of high fat or high protein or low carb or uh, vegan or whatever. So, you know, you could, if you're vegan, you could eat chocolate donuts all day long and still be a vegan. It doesn't mean you're healthy, right? There's nothing intrinsically healthy <laughs> about being a vegan or vegetarian. Um, and that's why people, you say, whole food plant-based right because the whole food part of it is the most important part not the vegetarian like most people who are eating you could eat pizza and you know french fries and stuff it's just not that healthy for you um same thing with low carb if you eat a lot of highly processed foods that are low carb or high protein or high fat whatever diet you want to be chances are it's not going to be um good for you but if you eat things that are natural which, which you can identify as natural so 
uh, vegetables, beans, um, you know, uh, meats and eggs and that kind of thing, chances are you're going to be okay. So minimally processed is probably the more important than any of those other uh, factors in terms of the quality uh, of the foods. And then number three is I think one of the mistakes that we see a lot of people make is, again, using chemicals um, like artificial flavors and artificial sweeteners. So everybody thinks artificial sweetener as well. Hey, that's a great idea. If you're going to eat less sugar, then and you're going to take this with zero calories, well, that's great. Um, it doesn't tend to be great. Um, you know, when was the last time somebody ever said to you, "Hey, I just cut diet. Uh, I just cut regular soda out, switched to diet soda, lost 25 pounds." Like it never happens. Like nobody ever says that, and it's because the sweetness of those artificial sweeteners may be a signal for you to eat. So if you're giving yourself, you know, taking a diet soda or artificially sweetened, whatever it is, um, on the one hand, yes, it's, it's, it's good that you're not taking the sugar. On the other hand, if you're giving yourself uh, the signal that you are taking something sweet and therefore you should be eating, then you're going to get hungry. And if you're going to hungry, you're going to eat, right? So that's not a way to lose weight. So taking those artificial sweeteners and artificial flavors is, again, probably one of the more common mistakes we see people make. It's not a problem for everybody, but in some people, that is the problem. I mean, there's lots of people who we see who are drinking like 10 diet sodas a day and wondering why they're not losing weight. It's because you're, you're, you're constantly uh, sort of get, taking that sweetness and priming your body to expect food. And then you're wondering why you're always hungry. It's because you're stimulating your appetite by, by those things. And just to close off with, how important is the link between gut health and particularly mental health, but also just general well-being? I think it's much more important than uh, people think. In terms of gut health, um, there was a lot of excitement about the microbiome, like the bacteria in there. Uh, a lot of that research is still to come, but uh, it hasn't been, it's been very difficult to show any sort of importance to it. There was, um, uh, so the thing is about the gut health is that it, you're, you're the, the, the type of bacteria you find are going to change depending on anything you eat or don't eat. So if you eat a lot of sugar, for example, it's going to change the composition of your, your microbiome. Uh, but it doesn't mean that microbiome is responsible for gaining weight. It's probably the sugar. The sugar is probably more likely to cause that. Um, but the types of food, the link between diet um, and mental health is actually quite important. In fact, there's just one uh, recent study where they looked at a low-carb diet, and they found that a lot of mental um, health conditions also improve when they switch to sort of uh, cutting out all the refined carbohydrates and so on. So there's a lot of different uh, things about the, uh, the diet that we know about, and it turns out to be quite important. So uh, all these uh, hormones that we talk about that are affected by the diet, the insulin, for example, mTOR, which is another type of uh, receptor, they actually cut across a lot of uh, diseases. So ranging from mental health to things, uh, you know, metabolic things like diabetes and, and obesity, which then causes heart problems and kidney problems and, you know, um, uh, peripheral vascular disease, gangrene, amputations, blindness. So it cuts across almost all the diseases that we treat today. Even COVID, I mean, that's been one of the biggest things, but we know that obesity is one of the biggest risk factors for COVID uh, problems. Uh, so even something that seems unrelated is not, because if you have uh, type 2 diabetes, if you have obesity, you're just going to do worse with COVID than somebody who doesn't have those conditions. So yeah, all of these diseases are actually important, and they all feed back to the diet uh, that you eat. And is it about exercise? Well, exercise is important for sure, but uh, of the two things, diet and exercise, diet is probably the most important.
Dr. Jason Funk, thank you again for your time. I'm Nadja Swart for biznews.com.